So we got this old 1962 Massey Ferguson 65. It's a diesel with a Perkins AD4203 engine in it. Got the shaft. I'm trying to put a front uh, engine driven pump on this to drive the loader hydraulics. It's just kind of a pain in the rear having the pump on the back, plus I think it's going out. It's starting to make a lot of noise. So there's an adapter on the crankcase. Got that from, I, I just maybe like Steiner tractor parts or something, and a shaft. The shaft isn't gonna be long enough. It's made for the 165. The 65 has these three mounting points, and uh, unfortunately they're not coincident with the center of the shaft, which sucks. All the pumps out there these days seem to have the mounting points coincident with the shaft, which frankly makes a lot of sense. So I'm working on making an adapter. I've 3D printed up a prototype just out of plastic. Okay, so that's where the adapter looks like bolted up. And then if you look at it, you've got uh, you know a straight line between the center of the shaft. There's a cutout for the axle pivot, the front axle pivot there. So that's the way the pump would fit on with the adapter. It's just on there with friction right now. I did have to clearance the pump here a little bit on the top. It runs into this ridge here. I could have just mounted the pump in the other orientation, um, but the intake's on this side and I want the intake, the more simpler path, the intake to be on that side. And I also like the idea that it made it kind of more, gets the pump kind of more up out of the way. So the next step is I've got some 6061 aluminum one inch thick. I made this part one inch thick and basically um, I'm going to take and uh, use my cheesy little Chinese mill to see if I can cut this part out of the aluminum. This is the cheesy little mill that I'll be using. Um, I've been using it to cut some wood for a different project, but uh, what I've found is I found these, uh, uh, the brand is white side and it's a solid carbide tip intended for wood, but I was able to use the two flute version and uh, cut some aluminum projects with it. Okay, I got brave and set this thing to go on the aluminum. Because of the way it cuts, you can see here on the foam it runs about a 3 8 inch trench around everything. Because of that, these corners are going to become completely isolated and also the center tuck in there. So what I did is I put some uh, double-sided mounting tape over the complete bottom of that and uh, put it on the floor and stood on it, stuck the tape, and then screwed each of these two, each of the four corners that are going to come loose and the center to the wood. Now, I'm sure that this isn't legit machining practice, but as you can see, I'm using super slow speed rates and it's making very soft tips. So I'm hoping that this will be rigid enough with a you know really small school forces that are involved. So just for reference, I'm using one third overlap on a uh, quarter inch bit. So that's how much cut it's taking sideways. And the depth of cut is one millimeter. Every time I put up a video like this, there's a lot of, you know, real machinist people saying that I'm kind of doing everything wrong. And that may be the case. There may be much better ways to set up. But given the uh, very light construction of this machine, um, this seems to work okay and seems to make, you know, reasonably accurate parts. And uh, it's what I've got. A little introduction of the machine. This thing started out as a 6040, uh, just a cheap machine from, uh, I think, eBay, some random seller. I've had it now for quite a few years. Uh, the X axis seems to be fine. 
I've got some switches set up, but I don't have them connected yet. Uh, the G axis also seems to be fine. It doesn't have a whole lot of travel, maybe, uh, maybe interest in or like that. Uh, the Y axis, because the Y axis is moving this entire carriage, uh, it was pretty weak. You had to run it pretty slow. So, it had the same size as stepper on it. So I got this kind of a massive stepper here and uh, built a bracket to uh, make the Y-axis be able to keep off at high speed. Now, of course, <laughs> with this job, we were talking about the issue of this uh, motor speed control, which runs at 20 volts. I haven't done much with it. I just run it and it on and it off. I think it's set for 11,000 RPM. And because it runs at 220, there's this box here that uh, is basically just a 110 to 220 inverter. And I'm driving the whole thing with this uh, old power supply, the second motor thing at 50 volts. Then inside of this case, the board that controls everything, I forget what, that was another eBay find. And it seemed to be pretty good at the time, but it's got some problems with this Geco interpreter that makes it slow down. It makes it so I have to run it in a non optimal manner. Uh, then it's got uh, three small and one big um, second motor drivers in it. And I added a fan and a filter on it to uh, try to keep it cool. The software that I'm running is Visual Cam that's to create the paths. That has some problems with it and it's very expensive, but I haven't kept service, so it's not updated. Um, let me see, to kind of run through my my tool chain, uh, this is Visual Cam and I bring the STL in and it generates a tool path. Something is wrong. I've got, I've told it, it makes the holes too big. I've told it it's a quarter inch bit and it makes a quarter inch track, but for some reason it makes the holes consistently big. So I'm gonna, so I manually change the holes to be smaller and I'll drill them out to the proper size to use the drill press. Then once, uh, so the STL comes in, that's the yellow piece. You set a bunch of parameters and it generates the tool paths. Then the tool paths, uh, this program exports them as G code. Then I've got uh, Mach 3 over here. And Mach 3, you bring the G code into it and you set your zero. And then, like on the feed rate here, I've got it down to 40%. Uh, you set the speed rate in this program over here, but then you can tweak it over here. And then you can see the progress in uh, Mach 3. See if I go to the tool path here. And you can see there's, a, there's the tool moving along, making the white line. And so if you compare that to real life, you see it's over here at the far edge of the, of the part. So anyway, this... Uh, this whole software chain is, is very depressing and clunky, and I wish I had something better, but that's what I've got. Okay, doing a little checkup on the thing. There's getting to be a pile of aluminum. And here's where it's at. So it's getting there. Well, some bad news here. Got a little ways down, and bit broke you can see it broke way up the shaft there unlike a drill bit you can usually just pick the aluminum out this aluminum is stuck hard on there welded in pretty good so i'm gonna guess the bit's starting to get dull that made things hot hot aluminum started sticking got worse and worse all right, I found this uh, Diablo that's new, quarter inch. It's not a spiral, it's just straight. All right, got the new bit in there. Haven't lost a zero at the software reset, and it's cutting the imaginary part. 
until a couple of hours from now when it's down where it needs to be. Well, this job is fast turning into a train wreck. I put that straight carbide white side bit in there last night and the uh, intention was to let it run all night and figuring it should get down there and finish up that last little job with a nice sharp tip. But I mean, it cut a little bit of something because this was all vacuumed up when I put it in, but it did not make it very long before it broke off. I found that bit finally, it's broken off in that hole. A little curious, there should have been plenty of clearance in there, but who knows. I'm thinking maybe I'll tip this thing over. There's some uh, counter sinks on the backside that I had given up on cutting. And we put in, I've got a ball nose that I wouldn't have to run in town to get. And uh, get it zeroed up and try cutting it from the backside of the ball nose. That could cut out the uh, counter sinks for me. Okay, the, I've turned this thing over and put in the ball bit. Well, I'm turning this thing over and uh, going at it with a bull nose or spherical round quarter inch bit. It's actually come down and you can almost, you know, the two sides are... Okay, take another look at this part. It's now broken through on the, on the major points. It's, it's not all the way through everywhere. Like, well, I guess it's broken through these too. I'm not entirely sure how well things line up. I mean, it doesn't look too horrible looking like on that edge or uh, looking at that edge. So I might have actually got the alignment between the top operations and the bottom operations okay. It may turn out that this is a salvageable part. So I had absolutely zero confidence that it would be usable after watching those bits break on the backside. So there's the part and uh, there's a little lip on this side, overhang, this side, there's a little step coming down. But it's it's not far off. Um, it's pretty close. I think it'll work. I think tomorrow I'm going to put the square bit in and I'll generate a little G-code file that will square off the bottom of that hole. Uh, these holes take these big 5 8 bolts. So by the time I come through the middle of this here with the 5 8 that'll make the taper intersect properly with the holes. So that'll be fine. These holes get uh, drilled out and threaded with a 9 16 so I think this part's going to be usable, man. That was a that was a darn rough uh, path to get there, but uh, well, that worked about as good as I could imagine. Okay, using the square bit, I was able to square off the shoulder in the bottom of that hole. Bolt fits in there nicely. Uh, these countersinks look correct for the uh, bolt that goes into them. So basically what I have to do manually here is, is run this hole up to the correct size for a 9 16 and then tap it. Same with this, same with this hole over here. This hole needs to be bored out to 5 8 to take these monster bolts here. Same with this one and this one here needs to be drilled through at 7 16 to match this guy. Okay, I had to do a little bit of manual cleanup with a sander inside there, and then it fit on there nice and tight. I got these two 9 16 holes threaded and mounted to the pump. That looks good. So now that I know all that will go back together, uh, I just need to go mount this ring over the tractor. So there's the adapter mounted onto the tractor. Uh, my alignments on the holes aren't perfect, but they're close enough that everything's threaded and it pulled in. And then there's the pump bolted to the adapter. 
and well, I'm pretty happy the way it worked out. You can see the countersunk bolts through here, and there's a reasonable clearance between the axle and the cap. I'm sorry, the front axle pivot cap here. There's a clearance in there for it. And the big 5 8 countersunk bolts, you can see the threads come through, so they're plenty long. These, these bolts could maybe be a quarter inch longer. You can't quite see them come out. But, uh, oh, no, boy, I'm, I'm happy with that. It's very sturdy, of course. And uh, I did have to clearance the pump a little bit up here. To, uh, well, I had to either clearance the tractor or the pump. I can get a new pump pretty easily. I can't get a new tractor pretty easily, so I just uh, I just shaved the pump a little bit. So there you can see the clearancing that of the pump. I just used the bandsaw to shave that a little bit. I mean, didn't remove that much and was able to leave a good flange against the aluminum there. Hopefully, <laughs> I don't go to put pressure on this the first time and it blows up. If it does, well, we'll burn that rich when we get there. So, thanks for watching the video. I know that was kind of long and torturous, but uh, got a nice mount for my PTO pump now. And all it took me was a whole bunch of time and effort and stress.